Thank you. Uh, let's bow our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are an awesome God, and we have been singing your praises, and you are so worthy. And Lord, we thank you that you are a God who speaks. Thank you that you are a God who interacts with us, a God who does not leave us in the dark, but who leads us and guides us. And you are a God who delights in working with us and through us. And Lord, how we desire and long to better understand you and better know your voice and better cooperate with your leading and your working that we might be yielded vessels fit for your use and used for your glory. Lord, we desire that our lives would increasingly make a difference in this world that we live in. Guard us from wasting our lives on things that in the end will not matter. But Father, may our lives be invested deeply into that which is eternal and that which brings glory to your name and joy to your heart. And Lord, that which brings lasting joy to our lives. Father, I confess my weakness, I confess my need. And as I stand before this congregation, I ask that you would enable, that you would use this weak vessel, speak through me, through your word, by your spirit. Lord, that we might all uh, learn that we might all rejoice together in the goodness of our God that we see revealed through the word of God. Lord, I pray that you would unite our hearts and strengthen us as a body and as the family of God. And I pray that we would better understand and learn how it is that you want to work through us and use us. And Lord, we humbly confess that there is much we have yet to learn and much of you we have yet to experience. And so lead us on and lead us deeper and lead us truly. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 19 through 22 this morning. These passages are very short, but it says, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. And abstain from every form of evil. It was at a, a pivotal point in my life when uh, the Lord was deeply challenging me to total surrender of all aspects of my life to him. I was 24 years old and wrestling with God's call to be willing to follow him wherever he led me, whatever the cost. I think I, or at the time, I thought I was probably 95% there, but there was uh, unapologetically a holdout in my life. The question of whether or not I would be willing to let him lead me as a missionary specifically to Asia. I said no. And to try to appease my conscience and prove that I was not resisting the Lord, uh, that no was in my heart, but to him with my lips I was saying yes, but I knew in my heart it was no. So I reluctantly agreed to apply for a one-year missions internship to the Philippines through the Bible college I was attending, and I thought that would get them off my back, <laughs> that it would prove that I'm willing, God. I'll, I'll, I'll fill this out. But then I proceeded to pray fervently after submitting this application. I interceded fervently that God would not allow my name to be chosen to be part of the mission team. 
But much to my shock and dismay, I was chosen. And so immediately I made an appointment to meet with the missions director who would be training our team and sending us. And I walked into his office at the appointed time, sat down across from him on his desk, and proceeded to present my carefully rehearsed appeal explaining that I had made a mistake in applying and he had made a mistake in choosing me and we needed to get on board with God's will for, for this whole situation. But before I could finish, he interrupted me. He calmly leaned forward, looked me straight in the eyes and spoke words that I'm sure I will never forget because of the impact they had on my life. He said to me, Ron, the Lord is taking you to the Philippines, and, I, and, and he is going to one by one knock out from under you everything you have ever trusted in until you have nothing left but Jesus Christ alone. And then he's going to let the storms of life blow and beat against you until he, you have been convinced that Jesus is all you need and you can trust him. And uh, at that moment, I knew it was a word of prophecy. And it was consistent with what God had been speaking to my heart for many months. But never before had God to, spoken to me so clearly and so forcefully and I walked out of that office keenly aware that I had been chastised by God for my Jonah-like disobedience. But that word of prophecy had also infused me with a strong sense of confidence and conviction that going on this mission was not some mistake but was clearly the leading of the Lord in my life. And indeed, everything that the missions director had spoken to me very definitely came to pass. There are two extremes that are to be avoided by Christians in relation to uh, prophecy. The one extreme is to prohibit prophecy or to not want anything to do with it. The other extreme is to be gullible and naively accept all prophecy as an authoritative word from the Lord. Both of these attitudes are wrong and dangerous. Prophecy is a gift from God, and it is intended for the strengthening and the enhancement of the church's ministry, but it is also something that the enemy will try to uh, manipulate to bring harm to the church. There is such a thing as false prophecy. But there is a safe and healthy way to handle prophecy that will benefit the church and safeguard against the enemy distorting it for his purposes. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. The Bible says, Do not quench the spirit, and do not despise prophecies. Do not. The expression, do not quench the spirit, or do not extinguish the spirit means do not put out the Holy Spirit's fire. That is the meaning of do not quench the spirit. The word quench, meaning to put out the fire, is the same word that is used in reference to, uh, to Jesus in Matthew 12, verse 20, where uh, it says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking or smoldering flax he will not quench. He will not put it out. The presence of the Holy Spirit at work among the people of God is often in Scripture compared to fire. When God is at work among his people, you often see that comparison to fire. We could look in the Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, I'll just give three examples. Jeremiah chapter 20 from the Old. Then Jeremiah said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. The people weren't listening to him. He was being persecuted and opposed. He was frustrated. He said, no more. I'm not going to speak it anymore. But his word, referring to the word of prophecy, 
was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Then the New Testament, Luke chapter 3, verse 16. John the Baptist made this declaration, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then, of course, Acts chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, on the day of Pentecost, there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And we could go on and on. It's, it's a common theme throughout the scriptures But the word quench means to put out the fire. And the presence and ministry of the Holy Spirit is compared in Scripture to fire. And therefore, the declaration in verse 19, do not quench the Spirit, is to attempt to eliminate or stop the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Don't do it. The fact that the Lord prompted Paul to instruct the people not to quench the Spirit implies that uh, people can put out or can eliminate, can quench the manifestation of the Holy Spirit from occurring in their midst. It's possible to do that. The Holy Spirit is often described in Scripture as a gentleman because he will never force himself upon people. He will usually only act where he is welcome and where he is invited. He will not force himself. So if a group of people do not welcome his ministry, and particularly if they reject his ministry, they will most likely not experience his ministry. 2 Timothy chapter 1. In verse 6, Paul says to, to Timothy, For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. This is the opposite of quenching the Spirit. Fan into flame. Uh, the gift of God, encourage it. If you've ever tried building a campfire and, and you just got little embers smoldering, uh, you can blow on those embers or, or fan them and get them to burn hotter and hotter. Uh, that is what Paul exhorts Timothy to do, fan into flame the gift of God. And it's the opposite of quenching the spirit. Verse 19 gives the general exhortation, do not quench the Spirit. Verse 20 goes on to address a specific way in which the Spirit of God can be quenched by despising prophecies. Do not despise the prophecies. Or another translation, do not treat prophecies with contempt. How do Christians despise prophecies? How do you despise a prophecy? or prophecies in general, by scoffing at or mocking those who do prophesy or those who do believe in it as something valid. By prohibiting the exercise of this gift, you are despising it. By an attitude of unbelief or refusal to seriously consider the gift, you are despising it. By refusing to study about it, get to know, become familiar from God's word, uh, refusing to teach about it, or refusing to to pray for God to minister to our church through this gift. No, I'm not going to pray about that. Um, That is despising the gift. To treat prophecies with contempt or to despise them will quench or put out the Spirit's fire And it may result in no prophecies or no ministries of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit being experienced among your church. This may be a big reason why, uh, or explanation for the question I'm often asked, why the gifts of the Spirit are more common in some churches than in others. 
I believe it's because some churches are open to the gift and other churches are closed. And some churches, they fan into flame the gifts of the Spirit. In other churches, they quench it. The presence of the Spirit's activity in the church was closely connected uh, throughout Scripture, but particularly in the New Testament, with God speaking to the people by way of prophecy. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 17, we have a quote from the Old Testament from the prophet Joel. The Bible says, It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. A connection made between the ministry of God's Holy Spirit and prophecy being a prevalent manifestation of that presence, of that ministry. Now we know from secular history, and there's a lot of secular records from the uh, uh, area of Thessalonica, uh, Greek history, Roman history, but we know from history that the educated Greek philosophers were cynical towards prophecy. The the, the elite, the educated elite, they, they treated prophecy with cynicism. And in Thessalonica, there were also a number of pagan cults who practiced a demonic form of prophecy. And so therefore, into this context where you've got uh, the superstitious pagans with demonic activity and you've got the educated pagans, the philosophers, uh, and their skepticism, uh, into this context came uh, the new church, uh, the Thessalonica. Thessalonican church and um, these new believers living in this environment would naturally be predisposed to view prophecy in a negative light they associate it with the um, the pagans and have been influenced by the elite much the same way we have this environment in, in our culture. And many, many Christians in our enlightened secular culture are skeptical of any sort of supernatural activity among the church, um, including supernatural speech, suspecting it to be either a mental delusion or some kind of demonic activity. But the Bible teaches that it can also be the work of God. And the people of God are to be open to that while remaining cognizant of the fact that there are also ungodly counterfeits out there that need to be filtered out. So recognition that God works through the prophetic, but so does the enemy. And so don't be gullible. But it's, it's not unlike the gift of teaching, which I am uh, exercising before you this morning. Just because there are many false teachers and false doctrines out there, and there are many, um, that does not mean that the best course of action is to ban all teaching. Because there's so much false teaching out there, we're going to ban it all. No, that's, that's not the course of action. But we are fools if we do not carefully screen all teaching, including you need to be screening what I am teaching. We must have the same attitude toward the gift of prophecy. The answer, because there's false prophecies out there, is not to ban it altogether, but to screen it. So what exactly is prophecy? Prophecy is... uh, not primarily referring to the prediction of some future event, though it does include that from time to time. But prophecy is a spiritual gift described uh, in some detail in chapters 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians and elsewhere uh, throughout the Bible. Prophecy can be defined as speaking forth infallible human words 
something that God has spontaneously brought to your mind. That's a definition that I uh, like to use. I'll read it again. Prophecy is speaking forth in fallible human words something that God has spontaneously brought to your mind. And so it's, it's not something that you've learned from reading. It's not something you've learned from observation or somebody told you. Uh, it's something that in a moment of time comes into your mind and, and then you speak according to the impression that's on your mind. But what you speak is your own fallible words, not the infallible word of God. The message that God brings to our minds, the impression that he brings to our minds, uh, to those who have the gift of prophecy, the, the message from God, what comes from God into your mind will always be 100% pure and true. But our perception of what he reveals is not 100% clear. As 1 Corinthians 13 verses 9 and 12 tell us, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but there's coming a time in the future we will see clearly as face to face. And so prophecy, what God has impressed upon us is 100% pure and accurate, but our perception of it, our understanding of it is not. The New Testament gift of prophecy is therefore different from the process that God used to give us the scriptures. For example, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, the Bible says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. It's not left up to you to interpret and then write down what God has put in your heart. It doesn't happen that way. God has overseen the whole process so that what he's put in the heart of the, of the writer of Scripture is exactly what ends up on the page. No private interpretation in between. For prophecy never came by the will of man. And this is speaking of... Uh, the prophecy of scripture. This is speaking of Old Testament prophets, uh, New Testament apostles, who what God gave them ended up being our scripture. No prophecy of scripture ever came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit put something on their heart, but the Holy Spirit also caused to come out of their mouth and out of their pen exactly word for word what he wanted communicated. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture, meaning not just what came into the mind, but what ended up on the page, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Right? Meaning it is God-breathed. In the making of scripture, it was not then just the revelation that comes to the mind that is inspired, but the entire process of clearly hearing, processing, speaking, and writing was carried out under God's sovereign control so that the exact words of God that he wanted communicated were communicated exactly. Psalm 13, verse 6 and 7 uh, make that clear. This type of revelation and communication, however, ended with the completion of uh, the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. With the completion of that, God no longer inspires and speaks with this kind of precision through prophets and apostles today. That type of prophecy is done. It ended. But there is a form of prophecy that the Bible talks about that continues today, and it is to be judged, it is to be critiqued, because it is not the word of God. Now, the New Testament gift of prophecy, God brings accurate thoughts to a person's mind, but he doesn't carry it farther to ensure that there is precise accuracy in what comes out. 
The person has to put into their own words what they believe that God is impressing upon their minds. And therefore, there is room for error in the process. And we have what we read in verse 21 and 22. We are to test these things. Hold on to what is good. Reject what is evil. So through the revelation that God brings to your heart, when he is giving you a prophecy, um, that revelation will be true, but your understanding of it, your perception may not be clear, and your interpretation of it may not be accurate, and your attempt to communicate it may further flaw the message. The fact that God has spoken perfectly doesn't mean that you have heard or understood or passed on perfectly. I encounter this all the time, and all of us do, when you're trying to teach the word of God. Here I've got before me the inspired, inerrant word of God. And now I try and explain what it means. And my explanation may come out wrong. God can impress upon your heart something that is true, but your attempt to communicate it um, may garble it. The fact that God has spoken perfectly doesn't mean that you have heard or understand or passed on perfectly. Therefore, a word of prophecy must always be tested, judged, and evaluated by comparing it with Scripture. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 20. Do not despise prophecies. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, states it in the positive. Verse 1 is pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. That is the opposite of despising a prophecy. Don't despise it, but more than just be neutral about it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, desire the spiritual gifts, and especially that you may prophesy. Romans chapter 12 and verse 6 says, Having then gifts, speaking of spiritual gifts, differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If God has given you the gift of prophesy, verse 6 goes on to say, let us prophesy in a proportion to our faith. Has God given you the gift? Use it. Note the role of faith. The implication is that you do not, if you do not believe this is a valid gift, you will probably not experience it. What is the purpose of prophecies? Why does God give us this anyhow? Isn't the Bible good enough? It's not a case of is the Bible good enough or not. Uh, it's God sovereignly works in his way and does things according to his plan and his purpose. And so what is the purpose of prophecy? In the Bible we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3 says, But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. So prophecy is for the building up of the members of the church to edify, to exhort, to comfort. It's for the building up of the church. Secondly, prophecy is for disclosing the secrets of the heart bringing conviction of sin and to convince unbelievers of the presence of God among believers. So if there's unbelievers, part of its function is to convince them that God is among us. Um, look at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 24. Speaking of the gathering of the church, if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed by the prophesying, 
And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. I uh, read of an experience one Christian had while uh, on a flight. Shortly after takeoff, he casually glanced across the aisle at the person sitting across from him and the word adultery came clearly into his mind as he looked into the face of the middle-aged businessman sitting across from him. The man saw him staring at him oddly and snapped, what do you want? And then a woman's name came clearly to his mind. And so he cautiously asked the irritated man, does the name Jane Smith, that wasn't her real name, but does the name Jane Smith mean anything to you? The man went pale and whispered, we need to talk. And they found two empty seats together and they sat down. And the man confessed to having an affair with a woman named Jane Smith. And through the conversation that followed, the Christian was able to lead the other man to repentance and faith in Christ Jesus. What is the purpose of prophecy? To expose the sin of the heart to bring conviction, and to reveal that God is among us. Prophecy is for confirming direction. As in my example uh, at the beginning when prophecy confirmed what God had been calling me to, that I was to go to the Philippines. And in Acts chapter 13, We read the same thing in verse 1. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. This was a word of prophecy that came to this group. Separate Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Note that this was confirmation of a calling that God had already placed on Barnabas and Saul's hearts. And this prophecy came to confirm it. Because God's speaking something to your heart and it's private between you and the Lord. And we all know Is this really the leading of the Lord or not? Is this God or is this my imagination? Is this some other? God, is this you? And then someone who hasn't been part of this conversation uh, says to you the same thing that you sense God is speaking to you in the privacy of your heart. It brings confirmation of God's direction. And then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away and thus began Uh, the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. Prophecy is to warn the church of danger, a danger that cannot uh, naturally be perceived. In Acts chapter 13, a little further on that chapter, then uh, they're on the, Paul and Barnabas are on the island of Crete, and then Saul, who was who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at this particular man and said, Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And so there you had prophecy, a prophetic insight and message that came to Paul, and he spoke it, and it exposed the evil that was in the, the audience. I heard of a church in, in uh, New York where during a service, one of the members approached one of the elders as the service was going on and said to the elders, I, the elder, I believe the Lord has just revealed to me that there is a man over there in the back row who is demon-possessed. 
and he has come to pray upon some of the young women in our congregation. Believing this to be a prophetic revelation, um, because they, they knew the individual who had spoken this, the elder knew him, um, a couple of the elders and this individual approached um, the, the, the man in the back row. They tactfully approached him. And as they approached and began to talk, the demon began manifesting itself uh, in this individual. And they cast out the demon. And this man confessed his sin to them, confessed his intentions, which aligned with the prophecy. And... They led the man to faith in Christ. So the gift of prophecy in that situation protected the church from an unknown evil that was in their midst. And it exposed the man's sin and it led to his deliverance and his salvation. A man who was in bondage. Do we need the gift of prophecy? Are we beginning to see how God uses this gift and why he's given it to the church. I believe that some of you have a similar gift, but you have not been encouraged uh, to either recognize it or to exercise any spiritual gift. And I confess as a pastor, this is something we, we have not uh, strongly encouraged in the church. It's not been out of any conviction that it's wrong. It's been more by neglect. It's been more by bad experiences, a history of bad experiences and just (laughs) erring on that other side of to avoid more of those problems, we're just going to avoid this altogether. Maybe that hasn't even been a conscious, deliberate uh, decision that's been made, but, but that has happened. And some of you... Uh, have shared things with me that I think you need to be affirmed in. There have been several times in the past when a serious problem erupted in the church and some of you have afterwards approached me and said, you know, months before this problem surfaced, I knew this was going to happen. I knew in my heart that this was coming. Or you have said, I knew from the beginning that this person was not legit and was going to cause trouble. Some of you have said that to me. And when I have asked, why didn't you say something months ago? Your answer has been consistent. I didn't say anything because it was just an inner impression I had in my mind, but I had no evidence, I had no proof. And so I kept it to myself. We have to be careful of that and how we handle that. But that may well have been a prophetic revelation. And I don't say this critically of you. I say this critically of myself as your pastor. That had you been encouraged to accept it and embrace it. That had you realized what it was. And had you graciously and lovingly shared it with the appropriate people, the Lord may have used it to spare the church from trouble and to bring conviction to the hearts of those involved. I believe that prophecy can have such preventative effect on a congregation. And so we read uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 again. That we are to test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Grammatically, these verses are connected to verses 19 and 20, and therefore they are still addressing the subject of prophecies. To test all things is a broad statement, and it means literally that everything is to go through our filter. Everything is to be tested for validity, tested for truthfulness, tested for accuracy, tested to see if it is of the right spirit. But specifically, this instruction applies to prophecies in this context. In Christian churches today, the most common scenario is that a church either has nothing to do with prophecies at all, and you never hear a prophecy, or they are open to prophecies, but much of what you hear is either very questionable or outright unbiblical. 
occasionally you will be in a church where uh, maybe you've been in a church. I have been in a church where there has been a healthy biblical attitude and approach to prophecy. But both scenarios are unbiblical. We are not to quench the spirit by despising or discouraging prophecies, but neither are we to allow prophecies to be spoken without check, without testing them, and affirming those that are good and dismissing those that are bogus. Both extremes are wrong. How do we test all things, and specifically, how do we test prophecy? In much the same way that we test teaching or preaching. I'm sure some of you are testing me right now, and that's good. You need to be. You're, you're, you're running the word searches through, and you're looking, is there scripture? Is there scripture? Is this right? We need to do that. We need to do that with prophecy. Prophecy. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, uh, the Bereans were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. This is why this instruction is being written to those in Thessalonica. Guys need to test all things. That they received, the Bereans received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They were testing the scriptures We need to apply that same rigor to prophecy, test the prophecies, and see is it so. There are two tests that we must conduct in order to validate teaching or prophecy. The first test is to ask, is there any scripture that clearly supports what is being said? Can you back that up with scripture? So you, you run the test. You, it, our, our minds are amazing. Uh, the word search, especially when the Holy Spirit is called upon to enable. Um, you can quickly have scripture start coming to your mind that will either affirm or contradict. But the first test, is there scripture that clearly supports what is being said? If not, if you can't find scripture to back this up, then it is to be rejected as unbiblical. But if there is some scripture to support the prophecy, then you must run a second test, and that is to ask, is there any scripture that contradicts what is being said? Because folks, almost every cult, almost every false teaching that exists can back it up with some form of scripture. It may be distorted, it may be taken out of context, it may be a partial statement, but they will back it up with scripture. Then you need to run that second test. Is there any scripture that contradicts what is being said? And if there is no contradictory scripture, then you can accept what is being said as consistent with the word of God. And as verse 21 says, hold fast to what is good. Embrace it. Receive it. Apply it. But if there is scripture that clearly contradicts what is being said, even if there is scripture that supports what's being said, if there's scripture that contradicts it, then the prophecy is not to be accepted as true. The written word of God recorded for us in the Bible must always be held as our highest authority. All prophetic messages must be brought under the scrutiny and the authority of God's word and must align with the word of God and contradict none of the word of God to pass the test. 1 Corinthians 14.29 describes how a congregation is to handle prophecy that comes in, uh, in a church meeting. It says, Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. So there is some restriction. There is some guideline that the Holy Spirit has given us. And so the prophets are to speak, and the others are all to judge it. And if you're touchy about having what you say being judged by the word of God, keep your mouth shut. (laughs) 
Because God's word says that what you say in a public gathering, particularly if it is declared as being from the Lord in origin, we must judge it. We must validate that. And he encourages you to speak those kinds of things. Uh, prophecy is encouraged, but the, the judging is required. And so this is the responsibility of all members of the congregation to be evaluating what was said in light of what the Bible teaches. This is one of the many reasons why it is so important, brothers and sisters, for us to read our Bibles regularly and get to know it well so that we can effectively judge and evaluate teaching and prophecy and know, is this message consistent with the Bible? Because if you don't know the Word of God and you don't have around you others who do know the Word of God, you're vulnerable. If you don't know your Bible... You will be very handicapped in your ability to test teaching and to test prophecy to see, is this so? But if you know your Bible, you will be able to self-evaluate a message that comes to your mind before you even speak it to determine if it is something that should be said or not. And the enemy is able to deceitfully plant thoughts into our mind. We've all had that experience. The enemy has put into our minds lies and untruths about ourselves, about others, about God. He lies to us. And he has access to our minds and can plant thoughts into our minds and lead us to believe his deception is a prophetic message. But knowing your Bible will minimize your risk of being deceived and will prevent you from spreading deception to others. And passing what you say as a word of prophecy, you run it through your own grid first and then let the body of Christ uh, evaluate it secondly as, as you share it with others. And this will prevent deception. This will prevent lies from taking root. This is why we must test all things, hold fast to what is good, and abstain every form of evil. When we are told to abstain from every form of evil, this means that we reject the message. But don't automatically reject the messenger. You point out the error graciously, lovingly, so that the messenger can learn. There's a difference between naively prophesying something false and being a false prophet. A false prophet is not someone who's just, I didn't know that was wrong. I didn't know it was in error. That's not a false prophet. A false prophet is one who knows and says it anyhow. Just as there's a difference between me naively teaching something false, and it happens from time to time in each message. <laughs> well, I don't know. I hope it's not that often. But you need to be filtering what I say. I do my best to filter before I speak. And I filter it with the word of God. But I don't know everything. And I don't have a full, complete grasp of the scriptures. And collectively, we have a better chance of getting this right if we share our insights with one another and bounce things off one another. And so if I say something wrong, that doesn't make me a false teacher. A false prophet or a false teacher is one who rejects the truth and willfully proclaims a message that contradicts the Bible. They reject the truth, and they willfully proclaim error. Often those who are not confident that the message they have is true will share it privately with a, a more mature Christian and get agreement before sharing it publicly. I've done this when I've been unsure of a message that comes to my mind, 
Uh, I don't believe that I have the gift of prophecy, but I, simply because it doesn't come to me very often, but there's been a dozen or so times in my life where God has given me a word of prophecy. And there are a number of those times where I have gone to someone else and bounced it off them first before getting up and sharing it with, with a group or with others. And particularly if you're uncertain, oh, is this or not? Um, I'd really rather ask one or two people for their opinion rather than blurt it out to everybody and get the... <laughs> it's, it's practical. The Word of God is practical. And so it's wise to bounce it off someone else that you trust first if you're not sure. Anytime you hear a prophetic word, open your Bible or do a, a mental word search of the scriptures and carefully assess what was said. Is this true? Is this right? Is there by scripture that supports it? Is there any that contradicts it? You run that through your mind. And to do this isn't a sign of unbelief or pride or suspicion of the person speaking. It is being obedient to our Christian obligation to test all things. And so don't get upset if when you're sharing, others are opening their scriptures and they're checking. They're, they're doing what God tells us to do. Welcome it. And be prepared to learn from their response and to be affirmed and to be encouraged in it. Let us always, though, do it, um, our testing, the judging of what is shared in a loving and gracious attitude. Otherwise, we can be guilty in another way of the opposite sin and that of quenching the spirit and despising prophecy. Um, there needs to be that gracious and loving spirit in which this is done. Well, our, our time is up, and there's obviously a lot more that could be said on this, but um, a quick overview on this subject of rightly handling prophecies. Heavenly Father, you are a good God. And Lord, as we have looked at some of these truths and examples this morning, we recognize that each one of us, there are areas in our life in which, God, there's so much more that could be experienced. There's so much more that could be put into our spiritual tool belt that would enable us to minister more effectively. And Lord, I ask that you would deliver those of us in this room who have been uh, paralyzed or jaundiced, turned off by fear because of maybe bad experiences or having heard bad stories. Or Lord, just the enemy has saturated our heart with lies about your good gifts. Deliver us from those things that would cause us to quench your spirit. Father, I pray that you would give us hearts that are yielded and open, but obedient and wise. Lord, we want to welcome your ministry into our lives, into our midst. But Father, we recognize you have given us safeguards so that we don't become just another of those bad examples, another of those uh, wild and unbiblical environments where everything and anything is going on. Lord, we want to hold firmly to that which is of you, and we want to abstain absolutely from that which is not of you, but of the enemy. And Lord, your word gives us the way to discern that difference, to weed out the problems, and to maintain the health and the strength and the purity of our family gatherings and our ministry out there in the world. And so, Lord, I pray that we would grow in this. I ask for the working of your Holy Spirit in each of our hearts to create desire, 
and to move us into prayerfulness, inviting you, asking you. Lord, cause us to be students of your word and vigilant and diligent in checking everything with the scriptures for the safety of your church, for the safety of our families, for the preservation of our own spiritual lives. And Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.